Chloe, otherwise known as Princess Aspian, and welcome to my channel. Just be me. Holy moly, it has been a hot minute since I have recorded YouTube videos. Partly due to the fact that I dropped my camera, um, I tripped over it, and the entire thing smashed. Not the first time it's happened, probably won't also be the last time it's happened. It is what it is. <laughs> but everything else aside, we're back and I'm very excited. I miss you guys so much. And I'm very excited to be making YouTube videos again. Anyway, so as you guys are all very well aware, um, life has been very stressful recently. There has been a lot happening. I don't want to talk about it because, well, we've been speaking about it a whole lot and I don't want to bring it up anymore. But clearly, someone has put a curse on us or like opened up some ancient Roman burial or something like that. But 2020 isn't really going the way that any of us expected it to be going this year. Unless you're the one who made the pact with the ancient Roman burial, in which case, treat people with kindness except for you. <laughs> anyway, senses are all extremely heightened at the moment. It's a natural reaction to stressful, traumatic times. And for those of us who are neurodiverse, this is probably a time where our stress responses are going to be at an all-time high. This is our time where our sensory overload is going to be probably more than we've ever experienced before. So I wanted to talk a little bit about sensory overload today. I wanted to talk a little bit about what sensory overload is, what some of the symptoms of sensory overload are, and what we can do to help it, whether it's in ourselves or we notice it in our friends. So first of all, Chloe, what is sensory overload? I'm so glad that you asked, Chloe. Here's what it is. Sensory overload occurs when there is too much sensory input coming into our brains. So we're unable to process all of this incoming information and sort out all of the messages that are coming into our brain. This is super, super common in people that are autistic. In fact, I personally don't know anyone that's on the spectrum that doesn't have this. But sensory processing disorder can also be a disability. There's a diagnosis that is separate from autism. With the world the way it is at the moment, our senses are at an all-time high and processing information more so and more frequently and taking it in harder than we ever have before. Meaning that sensory overload is happening all too frequently. Usually, when our world isn't like this, I have sensory overload usually if I've been to a concert or if I've been to a festival or I've been doing a lot of public speaking. I'll come home and I'll know that I was in sensory overload. I'll be like, right, my body is not reacting the way that it should and I'll know that I am in sensory overload. And you would think the fact that we actually aren't able to do any of that right now would minimize the fact that we are having sensory overload. However, just because we are not experiencing all those things on that scale doesn't mean that our minds aren't. I have found myself falling into sensory overload a lot more frequently than I have while we're in lockdown and while all of this stuff is happening in 2020 than when I have been on a usual year. There's a lot to take in. There's a lot to process. Our brains are going through traumatic situations situations and as I said before this is a very very normal response to traumatic situations. Our brains are currently in fight or flight mode and sensory overload is just one of those aspects of it. So what are the signs of it? How do you know if you're in sensory overload yourself or how do you know if one of your friends is falling into sensory overload? So here are 10 different signs of sensory overload. Number one, loss of balance and poor coordination. As we are getting all of this input into our head, it's also hard to put out that input that we are taking in. This means that our balance and our sense of coordination can be pretty off. It's almost like you're drunk. And now I've never been drunk because I am a wholesome child, but from what I understand, it would be a similar situation and a similar feeling to being drunk. Autistic people that have been both drunk and in sensory overload, Please let me know, because <laughs> if that's the case, I never want to get drunk ever in my life. Our brains start to fizz out, our brains start to go, you know what, you're on your own, I'm going to have my own little rave party back here, but you're not invited to it, have fun on your own. And that's when our body goes, oh, okay, motor coordination, what's that? Never heard of her, see you later. Loss of balance, loss of coordination, very, very common sign of sensory overload. Number two, changes in skin tone, as in being too flush or being pale. If you notice that yourself or your friend has suddenly gone really pale or is suddenly getting red cheeks, then it could be a sign of sensory overload. Once again, our bodies aren't taking the signals properly and our minds and our bodies and our physical selves are obviously very closely interlinked. So if your brain is starting to stress out, it may also start to show on your face. This may also start to show itself in excessive sweating or cold shivers. Number three, unable to verbalize. Something that's really, really common for autistic people when they start to go into sensory overload is to completely shut off communication altogether. Words can be really hard for us on a good day. So when we're in sensory overload and we're getting so many different inputs from so many different things, words can often be the first thing that leaves us. Finding words and transferring the thoughts that we're having into verbalization that you can hear can often be really, really difficult for us, especially in these situations. In these situations, I use a set of communication cards which I created myself and you can find on my shop, princessaspian.com shop. There's a 
set of 13 cards in this pack with different basic phrases and sayings and yes and no and stuff like that. And there's also an autism ID card. These cards come in super, super handy when I'm in severe sensory overload and I know that I'm not able to get my words across, especially if I'm not with family or my friends aren't with me, such as if I'm at a concert or a club or whatever it is. I have my autism ID card in my wallet and I can hand it to someone and I'll be like, right, she needs help. Uh, let's do it. If you guys are interested in looking at it, you can find the link in the description down below for my communication cards. I also have a bracelet, which is an autism ID bracelet. It's like a medical alert bracelet. Once again, same thing. Can be really, really helpful if you're experiencing sensory overload and your verbal communication is one of the first things to go. Number four, racing heartbeat. When I was younger, I spent a lot of time at the Royal Children's Hospital because I thought that I had heart conditions. I thought that I was having a heart attack. Are you okay, cat? You good? You all right? Vicky, come here. Hey, come here, cat. It's okay. I used to think that I had really, really bad heart conditions um, because I would come into sensory overload to a point where it would feel like I was having a heart attack. My heart would be racing so fast. I would have really bad tachycardia episodes where my heart would go racing really fast and then calm back down again. Obviously, if that is a symptom that you have, please talk to your doctor about it because there is every chance that it could be a medical thing. Don't go through an undiagnosed heart condition just because some chick on the internet told you that it could be a sign of sensory overload because it is, but it could also be this. Please don't take my word for anything. However, a racing heartbeat can definitely be a sign of sensory overload or a panic attack. But just because it may come on because of a mental thing rather than a physical thing. It doesn't mean it's not something to worry about. A racing heart is obviously something that you need to take seriously regardless of the original cause of it. Um, so if you do feel like your heart is racing, if your heart is going too fast, make sure you take time out. Do not ignore it. That's when bad things can happen. That's when you can faint. That's when you can have fits. That's when bad things happen. And it's it's not fun, especially if you're already in sensory overload. The last thing you need is a hospital bed. So make sure to respect yourself enough that if your body does start reacting in ways that are not good because of a sensory overload episode, make sure to respect yourself enough to get out of that situation as quickly and as efficiently as possible. At the very least, sit down, have some water, find a quiet space, make sure you do things to get out of that situation. Also, breathing exercises. Remember breathing exercises. One of the ones that I do is box breathing, where you breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, out for four seconds, hold for four seconds, continue the process. Another one that I do a lot is where you breathe in for four seconds, hold for six seconds, out for eight seconds. I don't know what it does. I'm not a doctor. My psychologist told me to do it and it works. <laughs> but I know that it is proven to slow your heart rate down in those situations. Um, so remember your breathing exercises, remember to find a quiet space, and remember to try and find things that can help you calm down. Number five, hysteria and crying. Now obviously if you're getting to the point of hysteria, you're probably already well aware that you're in an episode. And once again, it is so, so important to find a quiet place. Hopefully you can get to a stage where you can understand that you're starting to have a sensory overload episode before it actually happens and before you get to the hysteria stage, because that's not fun. If you do find yourself getting to the stage or you have a friend and you start to notice symptoms of them getting to that stage, get out of the situation, find a quiet spot, whether that's finding a bathroom, whether that's finding a small exit area, whether that's leaving the situation entirely, it is really, really important to get out of there, look after your mental health before anything else, because that is the most important thing, regardless of what the situation is. Number six, cramps and nausea. Stomach pain is a really, really common sign of sensory overload. Once again, if this is a symptom that you're experiencing, please talk to your doctor about this, because it could also mean underlying conditions. However, if your brain starts to panic, your body also can start to panic, which is why things like a racing heart and stomach cramps and nausea can all be interlinked. Number seven, repetition of words. Repetition of words or echolalia is super, super common in autistic people full stop. A lot of autistic people experience echolalia, which is like a verbal stimming where you repeat words several times over. In sensory overload, this can happen or be heightened if it's something that you already experience. Once again, in sensory overload, you are experiencing so much input to your brain that you don't really know how to output it properly and your brain just kind of goes, so repeating words can be a soothing mechanism. However, it could also be that you're trying to get that word locked into your head. So for example, if I'm having a conversation with someone and I know that I'm starting to experience signs of sensory overload, I could start to repeat words because they could have said something and I'm like, I need to try and remember that. I need to try and process that. And saying it several times over can help you to process things. Which then leads us on to our next point, number eight, excessive stimming. The reason that we stim in the first place is to help us cope with sensory input. So obviously it would make sense that when we're in sensory overload, stimming can increase. We're trying to to ground ourselves, we're trying to soothe ourselves, we're trying to make sense of everything that's happening in our minds and in the world around us. So excessive stimming in situations where this is all extreme. This may be flapping your hands or rocking or shaking, maybe a different breathing pattern, it may be blinking really fast. When we're having so much input going into us, it can be physically painful. So we need something to try and ground us, to try and give us some sort of sense of reasoning as to what's happening. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by self-stimulatory activity. Now this isn't just for autistic people, everyone in the world stims and I would almost guarantee that the majority 
majority of people also stim harder when they're in nervous situations. Although neurotypical stimming is more along the lines of picking your fingernails or biting your lip or playing with your hair, autistic people stims may be a little bit more obvious, but it's all stimming and it all comes from the same place. Number nine, becoming easily agitated and angry. I mean, it would only make sense that if you were having so much input coming in, which you can't process, that you would start to get quite frustrated. You become tired and you become drained and you become zoned out and all you wanna do is get away from this and it's, sometimes it's impossible to do that so becoming frustrated and agitated is only normal once again it's really important to practice your breathing exercises in these times and if you can get it out of the situation make sure you do and number 10 difficulty focusing. This can be in a more literal example. For example, if sensory overload is happening inside of a classroom, a student may not be able to focus on their work or the stuff that's provided for them. Or it could happen if you're at a club, if you're at a party, if you're at a concert, you may start to drift out, you may start to zone out. You may not be able to focus on conversations someone is happening or start to repeat your words because you can't remember what you've said or what the other person has said. Sensory overload is terrifying. For those of you who haven't experienced it, imagine that you are at the loudest, craziest rock concert you have ever been to, but it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week and you cannot escape it. It can happen anywhere and a lot of the time there's nothing that we can do to stop it. It just comes upon you without any expectation. It just goes, hello, I'm here, I'm a takeover. Do you mind? And you're like, yes, I do mind. It's like, doesn't matter, can't hear you, see you later. Over the years, I have found that it is easier to get out of sensory overload and it's easier to not find those situations that would put me into it. But the only reason that I'm able to do that is because I've been doing this for a long time. I'm 23 years old, I've been doing this for a really long time. I know what the situations are that will bring me into it and I know how to bring myself out of it. Sensory overload will never leave you altogether. And the most important thing to know and to understand is how you can help yourself. But there are things that we can do to help us with it. First and foremost, the most important thing that we can possibly do is to know the signs, whether that be our own signs or someone else's signs. Every person is going to be different. Everyone's signs of sensory overload is going to be different. You start stimming more. Does your heart start to race? Do noises suddenly become excruciating? Over time, you'll start to learn what your symptoms are and what your first signs of it are, meaning that you'll be able to get out of that situation quicker and easier and earlier so it doesn't become a full-fledged melt down, which once again, enough fun, would not recommend that to anybody. Once you know that you're experiencing it, you can start to find out a game plan to fix it. If I know that I'm going to be in an environment that's extremely stimulating, such as a concert, a festival, whatever it is, I find my exit points before I go. Most places will have a map, so I'll be able to find that map and know where my exit zones are. Most places will also have a quiet area, at the very least it'll be the bathroom. I'll know where those areas are, so if I do start to feel a bit overwhelmed, if I do start to feel, oops, sensory overload is coming, I can go to those areas areas and calm down before it gets too bad. If the situation does allow for it, I'll also bring some items to help me. So for example, when I went to university, I would sometimes bring a weighted lap blanket with me if I knew it was going to be a bad day. I'll bring noise cancelling headphones with me. Just taking out one of those senses which could knock everything over. One of the times that I find myself experiencing sensory overload a lot is when I'm going shopping, especially if I need to find some specific items that are kind of all over the place. Bring a list, know the list, and know the shops that you're going to beforehand. This can really, really help to prevent overload by the sounds, by the scents, and by the options that are available. Overall, I think it's a completely person-to-person -person sort of situation, and who you are and what your triggers are are going to completely vary depending on that. I definitely plan on doing more videos about sensory overload, about some of the different situations that it can happen, about how you can get out of the situations and how you can cope with those situations, some of the other signs and triggers for sensory overload. But with that being said, I've been filming for a couple of hours today. I've had a couple of interviews and stuff that I've been doing earlier before I started filming this video and I can feel in my head that it is coming. So <laughs> self-love and looking after yourself and respecting your boundaries comes first and foremost with any situation. So I'm going to head off before I show you guys a real life version of it. Sensory overload can be really overwhelming, really scary and very, very real. A lot of people think that just because it's something you can't physically see, it doesn't matter. But your mental health is so important and something that we need to start focusing so much more on, especially now. Learn the signs, learn your sign, and learn what you can do to help yourself get over these things. Sensory overload isn't necessarily ever going to leave you altogether, but you can do things to make sure that you can control it better and to make sure that you get out of these situations. I love you guys so much and I hope that you guys are doing well despite everything that's happened in the world. I hope that you guys are looking after yourself. I hope you guys are staying hydrated. I hope you guys are wearing a mask when you go out because God Lord, please, I want to see Harry Styles this year. I hope you guys have a very very sensory friendly day and I will see you guys in my next video which will not be in like six weeks time I promise you anyway oh my goodness wait next week is One Direction's anniversary if we get a good buy tweet y'all will experience me in sensory overload 
Anyway, I'm gonna go. I love you guys very much, and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye. Just be